Happy Friday. John Lorden here. Thank you so much for joining me on another episode of Brain Scratch. Now imagine this. You're a mother with a daughter just getting out of high school. She gets a full ride scholarship, goes to another state, works on that for a year, but decides that she's getting homesick, comes back home, moves very close to the high school that she just graduated from a year prior, and then she is brutally attacked and murdered in her apartment. That is the real life story that is going on in today's case. This is the victim, Brittany Phillips. Her mother, Dr. Maggie Zingman, has been working very hard raising exposure to her daughter's case in a very interesting way. Uh, also, it was a friend of Dr. Zingman's that contacted me asking me to cover this case. When I saw what Maggie has been doing to raise awareness to this, I knew I had to try to help her. And it was very obvious once I started looking through the media and seeing that she was effectively collecting what I consider small town media, but article after article after article on this case, but from different small towns all across the nation. Uh, we'll share more about exactly what she's doing, but I've been in contact with her. I've been asking her a lot of questions. I've got some information. There's also a chance she might come on the channel if we need additional details after this, but um, let me give you the details that she passed along to me. Growing up, Brittany did gymnastics, dancing, and modeling. Her mother did theater and dance also, and when Brittany was young, she would dance in the same theatrical productions that her mother was performing in. Brittany also played flute and ran track growing up. Her mother says she was very adventurous and compassionate. Brittany graduated from Union High School in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and completed a year at Eckerd College in St. Petersburg, Florida. That's also where her mother graduated from. Brittany went there on a full-ride scholarship for chemistry, but was a year younger than most of the other students, so she decided to come home after her freshman year. When she came home, she moved into the apartments right next to her old high school and was doing a couple of pickup classes at the junior college so she could transfer to state school. Brittany was supposed to see her mother on the weekend that her body was found. It was also coming up on Brittany's 19th birthday. Uh, a lot of very terrible things uh, going on with this story. And one of the most terrible things is this woman has been searching for justice. It's going to be 15 years next month that she's been searching for justice. And how is she doing that? This van right here, the caravan to catch a killer. She's been almost in every state in the U.S. outside of Alaska and Hawaii in either this vehicle or one a lot like it. She has now had three vehicles that were promoting this information, trying to raise awareness to her daughter's case. And she's tracked on more than 200,000 miles in what is considered, I guess, 20 different long form road trips that she does all across the country. Uh, at one point, she even bumped into Nancy Grace and wound up on that show as well. Um, but getting national exposure has been really hard for her. And I could see that even the media in the media that I'm looking through. It's all kind of small town, local based media, not a lot of big major companies. I think the Nancy Grace appearance might be the biggest one that I've seen of, of the information that I've looked into. So what's going on with this case? Uh, we have to roll the clock back to 2004. Um, but a lot of the articles we're looking at are from a couple years after that. But it actually happens the last week of September 2004. Brittany Phillips, 18 at that time, was found dead in her apartment near 65th Street and Mingo Road on September 30th, 2004. Police believe the Tulsa Community College student had been dead for some time before her body was discovered. And this is from the Daily Oklahoman on the 6th of October 2009. Um, so we've already got some big problems. They know that she's been dead for a matter of days before her body's found. That means decomposition is setting in. That means, uh, it's getting more difficult to probably get a firm estimation on when the attack actually happened. Uh, let's jump over to the Billings Gazette. This is from the 27th of July, 2011. Brittany's story goes back to September 2004 when the 18-year-old was raped and suffocated in her second-story Tulsa apartment. The murder took place between 9 p.m. on September 27th 
and 8 a.m. on September 28th. And there is some information about what she did leading up to this. So I th they're pretty confident about the time frame of 9 p.m. on September 27th. Of course, like I mentioned, um, you know, when we're talking decomposition like this, trying to estimate the, uh, the time of death gets a bit tricky. Police collected blood and semen samples, but were unable to match the evidence to any suspects. But that's a good thing, right? Because if they collected semen samples, we're talking DNA, and we know how many of these cases get cracked with DNA, particularly if that DNA is being handled by a little company called Parabon Nano Labs. Is that what we have happening in this case? Stay tuned. Rolling through to KTUL.com. Maggie Zingman can't forget October 1st, 2004. I mean, it was almost out of a movie, she said. It's so bizarre, but it was pouring down rain. Rain was coming in my door. Zingman said a young sheriff's deputy told her that her daughter, Brittany Phillips, had been murdered and she had to contact a Tulsa police detective. I just remember almost like the living room caving in on me. Uh, she lived about an hour away from where Brittany was living at this time. And as you can imagine, uh, that must have just been a terrible feeling having an hour's worth of travel that you have to do somehow that you have to figure out how you're going to get yourself there. You've just heard one of your children has been brutally murdered. Um, she, she goes into it in a few interviews that I've heard. Uh, I'll really save it. We'll see if she comes on the channel so she can share that experience with you guys directly. I don't want to try to paraphrase it or something. It is, it's traumatic. It's terrible. Um, a friend had found Brittany dead in her apartment. Police said she had been raped and suffocated. Investigators were able to extract some DNA from the scene, but al after almost nine years, have not found Brittany's killer. Now, it's interesting. When I hear suffocated, it makes me wonder, are we talking about something being put over her mouth or something of that nature? In several places, I'm seeing that this is a strangulation case, but they're not being clear about was it done with someone's hands? Was it done with some type of object? I don't know if police actually know if they have a determination about how it was done. I kind of have the feeling that they do, but I think they're sitting on that information, uh, hopefully, so that it winds up popping up in court when there's some prosecution around this case. The Tulsa Police Department has one detective assigned to cold cases, Detective Eddie Majors. It's going to take the community to solve these, Majors said. He said tips are vital to solving cold cases and no tip is too small. It may be a very minor thing, but it may play a major role. Uh, and that is super tough when you're talking about cases of this age. We're talking almost 15 years ago, but I can tell you after working on the case that we worked on for three men, you can still shake up tips on cases 20 years old. You absolutely can do it. I firmly believe in it. I've, I've seen it happen. Um, so that's why we're here doing this coverage. We're trying to help this mother raise exposure, get these details out, see if that nudges someone. We're, we're talking Tulsa, Oklahoma, 2004. Some man was there that did this to her. We need help finding out who that man is. TulsaWorld.com has some coverage. This is from August, uh, about 11 months after. Nearly a year after her daughter's death, Maggie Zingman still catches herself thinking, I'll have to remember to ask Britty about that. As she sat alone in the space where the unidentified killer stole Brittany Phillips' last breath, Zingman scanned the rooms for clues to the killing. Then she saw something that appeared to be out of place. I told myself that I would have to ask Britty if it was that way before, Zingman said. Sometimes I still do that, think about talking to her. I hate when I do that because then I remember she is not around anymore to ask. So I actually specifically asked her about this moment. Uh, what was she referring to, Maggie, when she was saying that she had seen something out of place? Uh, she literally just sent an email back to me about this. Uh, she's saying that she was sitting on the balcony and it looked like the wood lattices on the door to her bedroom had been played with. And that's when she had that moment of feeling like she had to ask her daughter about it and then remembered that she couldn't. Um, outside of that, though, She's saying it didn't seem like the room was disturbed too much. You know, books were still kind of in their place. Um, the police investigators are saying that there was certainly a struggle that happened in the room. Uh, there's also a podcast called Unresolved that has done some coverage on this. They've got some details. Uh, they also interviewed Maggie. Um, their details include that 
Brittany's body is found on the floor beside her bed, kind of in the opposite direction of how she would normally lay in bed. Um, and at least according to some information there, which I haven't been able to confirm, but I think it basically came from Maggie herself. Um, there is some talk about the fact that Brittany might have been pushed up against the wall. Uh, it seems like there was a fight that certainly happened in those last moments. Um, but let's continue with the article here. Zingma described her daughter who had modeled as a beautiful, intelligent girl who stood out in almost any crowd. Zingman is a psychologist at the Mabel Bassett Correctional Center. Even with that background, Zingman is still struggling to cope with her daughter's slaying. Um, yeah, just looking into Maggie's background, the, the type of work that she's done. I mean, she's helped uh, military personnel that are having trouble coping with trauma. Uh, families, here we're talking about a correctional center and she's helping inmates. This is someone that has been very caring and has the knowledge and education to actually be very effective in these situations. But you're talking about this actually happening to her. This is a whole different direction. And I don't know if those tools work in that direction, but thankfully she's been able to work at that job, work a bunch of overtime. And then she takes these periods of time off where she gets her vehicle out. Uh, the vehicle has been wrapped uh, for free by a company. So I just want to call out who they are real quick because I, I love when people help each other like this. They're called Midwest Wraps. And I believe they have done three different wrapping jobs for her over the different vehicles that she's had for doing this. Um, and that includes, I believe, helping with the graphic design. They picked some of Britney's favorite colors and incorporated those. Of course, there's images of Britney all over the car, details about the crime written all over the car, and a very important new piece of information we'll get to also. Um, but just it, it's it's a terrible situation. This is someone that should be have the tools to help other people cope with that, but she's having to cope with this herself. And I think that just throws this thing in, in a whole different direction. I really do know that Jeff Felton, the lead detective at the time, and all the detectives are doing everything they can to solve the case. They're working so hard, she said. This is what is so frustrating. No matter what they do, he is still out there. A lot of evidence was found at the scene and forensic laboratory workers are still sorting through it and creating a profile of the killer, Felton said. Now it's interesting to hear that because they're talking about a lot of evidence here, but honestly, for information that's been released to us publicly, we're not hearing about a lot of evidence. Yes, we know about DNA sample. Yes, we've heard about blood sample. We're going to get into one item in particular that is mentioned by detectives uh, later to try to kind of respur interest. But really, in terms of evidence, that's about all that has come out, at least through uh, media information. Felton said that she went to a friend's house near 51st Street and Memorial Drive, and they went together to a class at the Tulsa Community College Southeast Campus. After stopping back at her friend's home, she got into her car and drove to her apartment. That's the last time anybody saw her, about 9.45 p.m., Felton said. We know she made it home, but she never attended any of her other classes that week. So let's pull up a map just to get an idea of where we're talking about. And this route that I have highlighted on the map is her friend's house at Memorial and South or uh, South Memorial and East 51st. And where she was staying is down here on East 65th Street at the corner of Mingo. It was called Glen Eagles Apartments. It's now called Somerset Park at Union Apartments. Um, we can just go ahead and drop down to street level real quick so I can just give you a little idea of what it looks like here. You can see they are pretty simple two-story apartments. Um, interestingly, take a look at this balcony. The balconies kind of jut out quite a bit, and then they have French doors at the top of them. Um, I'm wondering if this is one of the possible entry points. Uh, I believe her mother also said she thinks there's a possibility that someone, if they're tall enough, might be able to kind of jump up or maybe if they if there's something nearby they can stand on, uh, jump up and leverage themselves up into the balcony. Um, so that's one potential way that they may have gotten in. Um, but it is also strange. You hear second story apartment and it's like, okay, well, what do we have for possibilities of them getting in? You know, door being kicked in, something along those lines. Uh, there are no signs of forced entry here. 
So that also opens up the possibility, are we talking about someone that she might have known? Um, this is at BrittanyPhillipsMurder.net, which is a website that is run by her mother. Just some ideas on how they might have entered. Broken either through the balcony porch doors, windows, or all upstairs apartment have an entry into the attic, and the whole building shares the same attic. That's a really interesting consideration. I have never heard come up in a case before. I'm very curious to learn more about that. But if you can imagine that all the apartments are in the same building, and I believe she said there's eight units in one building connected, and that attic is open all the way across all those units, you're talking about just one hatch. You pop up into that one hatch, you can roll over into someone else's apartment, go out through their hatch, and it's done. And uh, a lot of hatches don't have any locking mechanism. Uh, I know some do, but I got to say for all the places I've lived in, I've never seen a locking mechanism on an attic hatch. So uh, very interesting thought and possible security consideration if you're living in a place like that. He either came there before she came home from school or after she came home, possibly after she was asleep. He possibly made it look like he broke in. He could have been waiting for her. Now, uh, her mom did tell me nothing of value was really missing from the house, so it doesn't seem like it was really a burglary, uh, and we know there was a sexual assault, so obviously uh, that could have been the motivating factor here, but in terms of making it look like someone broke in, uh, her mom says that it seems like some of the screens from the windows uh, were missing, and I didn't get great detail. I've, I've asked her, but I haven't heard back from her yet in terms of were the screens still there? Like, had they been knocked to the ground? Had they been uh, put inside the apartment? Uh, or were they totally missing? Is there some possibility the screens just weren't there in the first place? Uh, I don't have the details to that yet, but I'm wondering about it because if someone used it as an entry point, uh, you might assume the screen could be, it could actually go either direction. They could pop it out and then come in with them if the window's already open or just throw it behind them and it would be on the ground down behind them. Um, not a lot of detail that I have on that. I'm just kind of letting you guys know where my considerations are with this. We do have some official photos from Tulsa Police at tulsapolice.org of the location at the time. Uh, unfortunately, they are tiny photos, so I'm going to try to zoom in on them best I can for you guys. Um, this is another interesting consideration. I think I heard her mother talk about this on the Nancy Grace show, the possibility that if you go to her front door effectively, if you stand up on this rail there, you might be able to pretty easily get yourself up onto the roof. Uh, then if you're on the roof, could you get over to where the balcony is and swing yourself down into the balcony? I think it's certainly possible, especially if you knew that the balcony door was open at the time. Now, the balcony door is open in this photo. I don't know if that is when they showed up. Is that pre-investigation? I don't know if that's after people have been all through the place and maybe someone had to go out on the balcony to process it. Uh, so I don't know if this door was legitimately open at the time uh, of her attack. Um, but if someone was walking by, saw that was open, figured out, hey, I can go to the front door area, jump up on that rail, get up to the roof, hang down from the roof, and all of a sudden I'm in the place. Um, that could certainly happen. Uh, of course, we also have the possibility that she knew this person. Maybe this is a guy she was interested in, something along those lines. But um, let's continue here with more information over at the Oklahoman.com. This is from October 1st, 2007. And is really the only other piece of physical evidence that we hear about in this case. Three years after a Tulsa Community College student was murdered, Tulsa police are taking the unusual step of revealing a piece of evidence in hopes it might solve the slaying. Detectives have disclosed that a light purple pillowcase was left at the scene. Detective Jeff Felton said the pillowcase did not match any of Phillips's linens. Um, I actually have a photo here of the pillowcase. I don't know what to think of this. It's kind of strange to me that you would have a pillowcase that doesn't match some of your other linens, but I could tell you guys if I went to my closet right now, I'm pretty sure I would find the same. And essentially it would just be because it was a pillowcase from an old set and the rest of those linens have, you know, gone to the curb at some point and the pillowcases are still left behind. Uh, is this something that was really used by the perpetrator in this? 
I don't know. They're not telling us that they found this pillowcase and they were able to connect the DNA that was found on her to DNA that's found on the pillowcase or something of, of that nature. Really, it's all just based on this kind of assumption that, well, she's got no other, she's got nothing that matches this. So why does she have this odd pillowcase? Uh, in one of the last messages her mother sent me, she actually told me that she believes uh, the pillowcase might have been hers. She doesn't know if there's really a lot of value or importance in terms of the pillowcase. Investigators, however, are kind of also wrapping that up in the theory that maybe this is a robbery. Uh, sometimes people will take pillowcases with them so they could fill it full of stuff. I don't know who would rob an 18-year-old living on her own in an apartment. I just can't imagine that she had a lot of things or that they were a lot of valuable things necessarily. Um, and pulling off a robbery in an apartment, does it happen? Yes, absolutely. Um, I just I don't know that she would have been the best target for a robbery. And you know, combining that with what her mother said about not knowing if the pillowcase really isn't hers, I just don't know how much stock to put in that. Uh, we are looking for information from anyone who maybe had a suspicious boyfriend or suspicious roommate who is out at odd hours of the night or may recall having a pillowcase like this missing, Felton said. So once again, here it is. I don't know if it really plays into this or not, but this is what they're giving us. And for them to release this information, I would think maybe it's more important than they're letting us know. Maybe they thought this would trigger something in the public. Obviously, that's why they released it. Uh, obviously, it hasn't worked because here we are 12 years after they've released that information and this case still is not solved. Uh, back to another article at KTUL.com. Today marks 10 years since Maggie Zingman laid her daughter, 18-year-old Brittany Phillips, to rest. On October 1st, 2004, a friend found Brittany dead in her East Tulsa apartment. I've seen some other reports that make it sound like there was a welfare check, like police had gone by and they're the ones that found her. Uh, Maggie is even still a little unclear on this herself, but she believes it boils down to her friends were getting concerned because uh, they hadn't seen Brittany. And one of her friends went by and noticed something was wrong. Didn't notice if uh, it could have been that the door was unlocked or uh, there was something that triggered her. And she actually spoke to a family member that I believe is in law enforcement. And they said, don't go in, call the police. And that's what got the police there to make the actual discovery. So at least from Maggie, that seems to be the, the best version of what actually happened there. Detectives collected DNA from the crime scene and have since run over 3,000 samples in Oklahoma. That is just mind-blowing. Uh, on top of that, of course, they've been running it through CODIS, which matches against, I think, about a million or so criminal records uh, for DNA samples. Nothing is coming back on this DNA. Currently, they're looking at one specific person, but this case remains unsolved. I don't think that person panned out because this article is also from just about five years ago, and this case is still unsolved. Since Brittany's death, Zingman has found a way to keep her daughter's spirit alive. She travels across the country in what she calls a caravan to catch a killer. She shares Brittany's story and educates others about the benefits of DNA swabbing people under arrest. So it's hard to say that, you know, this is one of, I don't say good aspect, but this is probably the bright spot in this story is not only do we have her motivated to try to solve her daughter's murder, all of a sudden that extra will, spirit, energy, however you want to put it, starts bleeding over into helping other people. And this is a pretty big consideration. Honestly, when I first heard this, I didn't know what to think about it. Essentially, she's been pushing for DNA testing to be possible when someone is arrested. Now, in some states, it's for specific types of arrest, which I really think makes sense. But consider the fact that you can have a person that's arrested, they could even be charged with something, but then they go through uh, a court process and then the charges are dropped or they're released or something. So it's, uh, from what I can see, it's a little controversial um, to think about as soon as they're arrested, test their DNA, take that and put it in some type of database. I'll share more thoughts about it and some other information I've pulled up as we go on, but um, she really thinks that that could be a factor in solving her daughter's case. Uh, and it might be, because if you think of a situation where maybe this person has been arrested for something else, but never fully charged, 
that would certainly snag it if people that are arrested for certain types of crimes are having their DNA tested at that time. But of course, we know DNA is a real touchy subject. A lot of people uh, have very big privacy concerns around that. Uh, she's also been trying to help educate people about the realities of, of DNA and the type of information they're extracting from it to use for this type of analysis. It's not like all of a sudden they have a picture of you naked. It, it really is not that simple. Um, so it's it's been pretty interesting to me to learn more about this as I'm looking through today's case. And we'll see where I wind up with it. But initially, when I first heard that, I kind of had a little, hmm, is that really a good idea? Because yeah, how many people are arrested and those charges just drop? And now you've kind of been cataloged at that point. Right now, she's working with a state representative in hopes of changing DNA laws in Oklahoma. And that was back at that time in 2014. Also in 2014 at Tulsa World, tip received in 2004 homicide of Brittany Phillips. And there was actually a number of articles that were kind of like this. I didn't want to take you guys through this whole chain of them because they basically don't give you any detail. Uh, after 10 years, the Tulsa Police Department confirmed it has received a new tip. Someone called in a tip to Crime Stoppers and detectives think there's some possibility there could be a match. And I've seen several examples of, of articles like this. There's no real information to share with you guys about that. And obviously... These tips did not pan out uh, or they haven't completely solved the case. It could be that some of these tips are pointing to a specific person or pointing in the right direction, but police still need help to close that out. And of course, as usual, in the description box below, you will find contact information for Crime Stoppers, for the local police. If you have information on this case, please, please send it in. I do believe a reward is available through Crime Stoppers. I saw that her mom was doing some fundraising in a few different places to pull together some money for adding to the Crime Stoppers reward. And I think even without that, Crime Stoppers usually has a base reward that they offer for tips that help solve crimes. Moving on to fox23.com. This is an article from May 16th, 2016. And we see uh, Maggie sitting at Brittany's memorial here. Um, I don't know how much I want to go into this aspect, but I think there was another, just talk about a tragedy on top of a tragedy. I saw a video with Maggie and I believe Brittany might have been buried in the wrong spot. Um, I just, I, I can't believe having to go through that when you're already dealing with all of these very hard feelings in a case like this. Uh, just this poor woman. I can't believe everything she's going through. Zingman spent eight of the last 12 years trying to get DNA arrestee legislation passed in Oklahoma in hopes that it leads to her daughter's killer. Governor Mary Fallon signed the bill into law requiring DNA collection at arrest for certain crimes and violent offenses. When the vote came, it brought me to tears, said Maggie Zingman. All the senators stood up and gave me a standing ovation, but I felt it was more for Brittany, you know. People tell me I'm brave or people tell me I could never do this, but I have no choice. Uh, that is a quote I've almost exactly heard uh, on previous cases with family members that I've spoken to. Uh, in particular, uh, the Buziak case, Jeff Buziak basically pretty much said the exact same thing to me when I asked him, how do you do this? How do you get through this? He said, you know what? You really find that you have no choice. You're just, you're, you're trying to find justice. Um, I just can't believe the energy that these family members tap into to be able to just go year after year after year, uh, in the face of all these odds and just keep going. It's, it's inspiring. It's amazing. And it also breaks my heart. OSBI, that is the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, said if the DNA arrestee law passed two years ago, hundreds of crimes, including 14 murders and 25 sex crimes, could have been prevented. Just to hear that one murder could have been prevented already makes me think this is probably a pretty good system. 14 murders and 25 sex crimes could have been prevented, and that's only in a two-year span. Collecting DNA at the time of arrest can save investigators time and money and could ultimately save a life, or 14 according to their data here. The United States Supreme Court sees swabbing a suspect's DNA similar to taking fingerprints or someone's picture when they're arrested. So that's kind of the same consideration that I hit with it. And even before I ran into this information about the Supreme Court speaking about it that way, I was thinking about, well, when are you fingerprinted? 
because that's essentially them collecting pretty personal information about you as well. It's an identifying mark for everything you touch. And I even did a little research on it, but as far as I know, during any booking process, which is certainly before a conviction, um, you're going to be fingerprinted. I don't know if it's that way in all states, but I think at least for the states I've lived in, that's how it goes. So that's where I really started to turn with this thought in my head and say, well, is it that different to actually collect DNA? And, you know, we've talked about DNA a lot on this channel. We're becoming more and more aware of the fact that while DNA is something from our bodies, we leave it all over the place. I mean, we've got touch DNA. I mean, my microphone, I'm sure, is covered in my DNA at this point. If you use a water bottle and throw it out, you've left your DNA traces all around. So it's interesting to me that, yes, I understand how personal and private information about us is, but DNA in terms of the practicality of living in this world is something that we're just leaving all over the place. So um, it really helped kind of form my opinion, especially comparing it to a fingerprint. You know, if you're booking someone and you're collecting identifying information about that, about them, shouldn't DNA be a part of that? Um, I don't know. I know it's going to start some interesting comments down below, but uh, let's let's try to be respectful in how we approach that conversation with each other. I know it's controversial. Tulsa police would like to go a step further than the arrestee law. Uh, TBD homicide Sergeant Dave Walker would like to see DNA taken at death from anyone whose body ends up at the medical examiner's office. He said then they'd know if possible suspects died. That's a whole different consideration I didn't even think of. I mean, honestly, in a case like this where 15 years have passed, we might be looking at that in this case too. You know, the suspect might not be alive anymore and there is no mechanism to capture that DNA and then to close that case out. We essentially have who knows how many cases that are open because the suspect is dead. Cases that are still being worked on, still being handed off in cold case departments, being uh, reopened occasionally from time to time, maybe in a case where the suspect is, is actually no longer alive. Uh, really interesting considerations about this. And of course, you know, with everything that's been going on with Parabon and Jedmatch uh, over the past year and a half or so, uh, we're going to hear a lot more of these DNA considerations. Moving on to KFOR.com. What is this? You guys have heard me talk about this product before. This is a Parabon snapshot, and this is a snapshot of the DNA that is related to this crime. Uh, obviously, we are talking about a white male, likely blue-eyed, possibly green-eyed, um, with light hair that could be either dark brown or it could be blonde. Uh, authorities say Phillips's apartment showed signs of a break-in and evidence at the scene suggested that a sexual assault had occurred. Now, I, I'm, I swear I've seen articles where they say there were signs of a break-in. I've seen other articles where they say there were no signs of a break-in. I mean, they're literally polar opposites. The only indicator that I have about a possible break-in is the information we're hearing about the screens. And even that information, I've heard that it was one screen that was missing from a window. Uh, her mother is, uh, I've heard her interviewed and she's saying that it's the screens from the windows. So I don't know if it's more than just the one. But I haven't heard anything about the door being damaged, anything about any of the windows being damaged or their opening mechanisms being damaged, uh, nothing like that. And like I said, several articles say no signs of a break-in. On Thursday, police released a broad description of the possible murder suspect. And once again, here is the, the snapshot um, based on phenotyping. Um, I don't want to go into the whole thing again. We've talked about this at length. Uh, we have a DNA special on Three Men and a Mystery. If you want to know all about this stuff, even if you're not following the case that we did on Three Men, just listen to that one special. We talked to Parabon. We talked to Jed Match. We talked to a DNA genealogist. It's all laid out exactly how that stuff works there. Personally, I'm not the biggest fan of the phenotyping tool. Um, because these are approximations. This is not a picture of what this guy looks like. They can't determine, does he have more weight on him? Does he have scars? Um, they can't determine, does he have a beard? I mean, there's just so many different environmental factors that can affect what you look like. Uh, I'd be actually curious to see what a phenotype of myself would look like. Um, 
it's just, it's, there's a lot of kind of problems I have in terms of circulating this and saying, have you seen this person? That's really not what I think this tool should be used for, but it did create a bunch of press around this case. And that can only be good to raise exposure to the facts of this case and to hopefully push that one person that has that information into calling that information in. Um, this, this is not only a mother, there's also um, Brittany's brother. This is a family that has been tortured with this crime for 15 years now. Someone out there needs to do the right thing and call that information in. Investigators believe the man was likely a fair-skinned white male with darker blonde or brown hair. He may have blue or green eyes and a few freckles. And police used DNA evidence recovered at the scene to generate a composite sketch. One of the first things that I asked, because um, I did see this composite sketch when I was first looking into this case, and I asked her mother, I saw that you guys used Snapshot. Did you guys go with a full genealogy route? They have gone with the full genealogy route. Uh, we're going to bump into some more information here about it. And I specifically asked, was that work started before GEDmatch changed their policy? Uh, I'm sure many of you know, now you have to opt in for your profile to be used for law enforcement uses. And that has pretty significantly reduced the amount of DNA that is available for this type of analysis. They did do some analysis before GEDmatch made that change on this case. That being said, we still don't have uh, this case quite cracked yet. Blonde hair, blue eyes, that would have been somebody Brittany look-wise would have been attracted to, you know, said her mother. It almost broke my heart because it meant that there is a good possibility that she trusted this person at some point before he did this. So that is an interesting use for this. Uh, we now know just in terms of who Brittany was attracted to, this might have been someone that she was interested in. This could have been, uh, it could have been a first date. It could have been someone that she was kind of seeing on the side and really didn't talk to her friends about uh, or in private, or uh, could have been someone she was just flirting with at some place and maybe they could have followed her home. There's just, it really opens up a whole bunch of new possibility and knowing that that could be a factor, I think is important in this case. So certainly that is one way where using a product like this phenotyping tool um, could be useful. Continuing at Tulsa World with an article from August 5th, 2018, so just about a year ago, and certainly before GEDmatch changed their rules, uh, a Tulsa cold case detective, Eddie Majors, hopes a genealogy website will help solve the killing of 18-year-old Brittany Phillips. The cold case detective submitted a request to his superiors in July to go forward with the plan. Once approved, he sent an email to Parabon authorizing the company to run a genealogy test on the killer's DNA. Genealogists upload the forensic samples to GEDmatch, an online database that connects other genealogy websites and permits law enforcement access to its records. Formerly, I mean, I guess they still kind of do, but now you have to opt in for that. The process then involves scouring newspapers, obituaries, social media, and any other information so geneticists can map out the killer's relatives, ultimately leading to his identity. Names of close matches are handed over to law enforcement for investigation. Um, and we know basically that they got this search and they got it in before GEDmatch kind of closed the gates a little bit on this process. Uh, what does that mean? I don't know. That could likely mean that they have a list of names. It could be that they're processing those names. It could mean that they're looking to basically the next step if they do find someone that they believe is a suspect is they want to do a one-to-one -one match. So in many of these cases, They'll follow that person around. They'll wait for that person to drop that water bottle or drop a cigarette butt or spit out their chewing gum. They will collect that. They'll take the DNA from it. They'll test it against the sample left at the crime scene and they'll know specifically, hey, we've got the match. This is the person. Are they in that process right now? They could be. I really, I don't know. Um, but let's continue here. The standard turnaround time for a case is 45 business days, but there is a very large waiting list. And of course there is because this technology just blew up in 2018. Um, the Phillips case has already been evaluated and her team believes it can generate useful information. 
There's usually a process that goes through where they first have to evaluate the DNA and see if it's a good enough sample for them to do this type of analysis. Obviously, it passed that. Uh, I spoke to Brittany's mother. She says that they did get to the point of doing the Jed match comparison. So sounds like it's moved along pretty far. But I know other cases, just like the one we covered on Three Men, where it's been submitted after this. I'm pretty sure in that case, they submitted the DNA sample after this, and they came to their conclusion very rapidly. But keep in mind, there's that whole investigative piece that still happens. Parabon doesn't tell you, okay, now go arrest this person. They just tell you, hey, that DNA you sent us probably belongs to this family, might belong to these specific people. It's then up to the detectives to do the rest of the footwork to close that out. And jumping over to another article at crimeonline.com with one of my good Twitter, I don't know if she's quite a friend, but I would say Twitter acquaintance, Lee Egan. I've been a pretty big fan of her work. Um, she also works on Crime Online, and of course, they host Nancy Grace's podcast stuff. Uh, Nancy Grace has an episode where here's an actual picture uh, of Nancy talking to Brittany's mother. Uh, that episode is in this link as well, so you can roll through and listen to that if you'd like. Uh, Maggie said the scene did not appear to look like someone broke in, although someone had taken the screens off of Brittany's second floor windows. Zingman said detectives indicated it looked as if the screens were taken off to stage a crime scene. The killer also could have entered the apartment through the balcony's porch doors. It's unclear whether the attacker entered the apartment before Brittany arrived home, after she arrived, or when she was sleeping. Uh, any of those situations, terrible. Uh, anyone coming into your home unexpected, terrible. Uh, but I think we also have to keep in mind the possibility that she might have been bringing this person home. This was her birthday week. She was going to be 19 on October 4th. Uh, was she looking to celebrate maybe with a, a private friend in a private way? Maybe. Um, I, I, her mother did tell me that she had plans. Brittany had plans to go see her mother that weekend. So it could be that she was celebrating her birthday earlier in the week. Um, although I would think her friends might know about that. I, I don't know. Another thing is we're really not seeing a lot of information from the friend that she dropped off. We have no idea what the person's name is. I'm not seeing any comments from them in any of these articles about uh, additional details. So there's a lot of information that we don't have here. But uh, continuing at fox23.com, the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation is rolling out its second deck of cold case playing cards, this time featuring 13 Tulsa police cases. The idea is they make these playing cards with the cases on them and they sell them to inmates for $5. Investigators hope the cards will then inspire conversation among prisoners that will lead to tips. I didn't know that they sold them. I, I've heard of this being done before, but I thought they just gave them to the inmates. Uh, I almost wish that they would just find a charity to donate to them so that they could just give them to inmates. I think the information is more valuable than the $5 per pack. Uh, each of the 52 cards features an Oklahoma cold case with the name, picture, and a summary of what happened, along with a number to call. And of course, on this second deck, they are featuring Brittany Phillips's case. They want to remind the public that no tip is too small or unimportant, even if it's just a hunch. There are money rewards available. That's also interesting because a lot of times we hear law enforcement complain about uh, the quality of tips they're getting, you know, particularly like in the Delphi case. But uh, here they're saying, hey, even if it's a hunch, send it our way. Uh, that might be a sign of really how cold these cases are. Of course, Delphi is uh, not quite a cold case, certainly hasn't been handled like one over the past few years. Uh, over at newson6.com, Lesson brings Tulsa murder victim to life for Union students. Union High School, the same high school that Brittany actually went to. Essentially, this is a criminology class, and the instructor thought that uh, why not focus on that case? I think it's it might freak some of the students out a little bit. You're talking about a case that literally happens, um, I mean, just a matter of feet away from campus. Uh, this is the high school down here. There is an apartment building kind of in between the high school and the apartments that she was living in. That's it. I mean, it's it's a block, I guess about a block away, um, but certainly would would raise their interest, especially 
when Brittany's mother shows up to speak with them. Meeting Brittany's mother gave them the personal side of the story. To understand murders are more than a list of facts, but each victim was loved and is missed by grieving family members. That's really something I try to focus on with my content. I appreciate other people in the true crime space that do the same thing. Uh, the first thing I asked Brittany's mother was to tell me about Brittany because a lot of the information I'm seeing here didn't really go into uh, who she was as a person, who we're all missing out on in terms of being a member of our society. Um, and of course, Maggie has this piece of information that she shared with the students and I really wanna share with you, um, just talking about how she deals with all this. Walking through it instead of away from it is how you heal. Trying not to feel is what can kill you. Once again, I think that's just um, showing her uh, knowledge and education, and maybe she is able to turn that towards herself a little bit and help herself out in this case as well. And the Daily Oklahoman on the 23rd of December 2013 ran a whole article about the DNA testing. Um, they featured just a little bit about Brittany, actually not a whole lot about her, but another quote from her mother, I won't stop. The sooner we can change these laws, the sooner parents won't have to go through what I've gone through. And seems to be working. This is a list of the states that are currently engaged with some form of DNA arrestee laws. And this is from NCSL, the National Conference of State Legislatures. DNA arrestee laws authorize the analysis of DNA samples collected from individuals arrested or charged but not convicted of certain crimes. Currently, 31 states and the federal government have such laws. So federal crimes, sounds like doesn't matter where you are. Um, but here we can see on the map, we've got more than half the country doing it here. Um, for some reason, seems like the Northwest kind of holding out, a couple of spots on the East Coast holding out, um, but a lot of the country rolling in the direction of supporting this. And uh, a recent update from BrittanyPhillipsMurder.net. Um, what goes on with these caravans? Essentially, she's driving around, and before she gets to a town, she'll kind of send a bunch of messages to the press, and she's, she tells them, I'm going to be there. The car's with me. I'm trying to raise awareness to my daughter's case and trying to help legislation go through for things like we're talking about with the, uh, with the DNA testing there. Uh, but this is a post from Maggie. After being in the quiet of Missoula media, I've decided to head home. A week without stories is too costly to stay in hotels, add miles farther from Oklahoma. Please, not about just our story, but don't forget the thousands of individual murders, the families that have lost loved ones, have loved ones missing, have cold cases. If you know any survivor of homicide or missing, give them a hug and tell them you care. If you see me on the road, please email, call, send a letter to national media. I need it more than ever now. So she is heading home. Actually, I've been communicating with her a lot today, and I believe she's on the last leg of her trip uh, getting home. So just want to tell you, Maggie, thank you so much for um, sharing as much as you have with us. Of course, the door is open if you would like to come on the channel and share more details with us. We will absolutely do that. Um, very sorry that you're having to deal with this. I'm sorry that you're waiting so long for justice to arrive in this case. Um, but I'm thankful for the good that is coming out of your efforts, uh, which is obvious. And um, I was pretty inspired. I, I really haven't looked into a case before where I've seen someone use local media in quite this way. Uh, and I think what you were doing there is is amazing. Now, I hope that we can help raise exposure, be a part of your team, and hopefully help that right tip. It's just one tip that needs to get called in. And maybe we can see justice in Brittany's case. Once again, I just want to give a very big thank you to uh, Midwest Wraps for helping her out, decking out the car. I think that is so cool of them to do. And before I end today's video, a big thank you to PayPal supporters Hillary Green, 
Randy Fry, Randy Vocal, and Jennifer Dixon. Thank you guys so much. I can't do this without you. If you would like to support the channel, you can go to www.lordandarts.com. You can sign up for PayPal. You can sign up for Patreon. You can buy merchandise. All of it helps keep me here doing what I love doing, helping families in need, just like Brittany's family in this case that we were looking at today. Take care, everyone. Hope you have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe. I'll see you back here on Monday with a brand new episode of Case Cracked on the Lord and Arts channel. Thank you.